This is Milt Pedraza. He's the CEO of the Luxury Institute. And over the past 15 years, he established the Luxury Institute, first and foremost, as a high-performance client relationship consulting firm, serving more than 1,000 luxury and premium goods and services brands across dozens of categories. His bio is in the uh, package. You can read it. It's like a who's who of his industry. He has conducted more research with affluent consumers than any other entity in the world. Advises and coaches luxury CEOs. We were just talking a second ago about Gucci, which he's going to, some things he said about Gucci were pretty amazing. Uh, he's prior to founding the Luxury Institute, his successful career at Fortune 100 companies included roles at Altria, PepsiCo, Colgate, Citigroup, Wyndham Worldwide. Now, I met him first uh, many, many years ago. I hate to even say how long it was, Milk. When uh, I was president of Camper Nicholson's USA, and we had a retreat in the Bahamas. And uh, Nina will remember this. And we, mought, we brought Milt over to do an interactive uh, luxury trends seminar. And it was fantastic. And uh, I thought that it would be good to bring him back here today to, to address you. And therefore, I have the greatest respect for him in this marketplace, and I'd like to introduce to you at this time, Mil Pedraza of the Luxury Institute. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I will walk around a little bit, if you guys don't mind. Um, it's going to be highly interactive today. I'm going to do a presentation for you. I hope to challenge a lot of your assumptions, and if I don't, I'll be disappointed. Uh, I really want to see if I can inspire you to open your minds to a bunch of ideas. Some of them may not be useful for you, but I hope they will be. And then after I share some of our ideas and some of how we are achieving high performance client relationship building results with different companies across many different categories, uh, we're going to take the benefit of your expertise. So by table, we're going to ask you to engage with each other, to do a couple of exercises on performance, and then to select a um, speaker, a spokesperson for your team, and share with us. Because again, lectures, I think the age of lectures only events is really leaving us, and we're really trying to get the benefit of all your expertise. I do want to ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, how many of you are in the industry zero to five years? Raise your hands. So you must be millennials or you came from another industry. How many are anywhere from above five years to 10 years? Okay. And then how many of you are, uh, let's say, 11 years to 20 years? And above 20 years? Okay. All right. So it's a really mixed group of people, and I love that. That's the way the world really works. That's the way industries rejuvenate themselves. I do have to stop and say one thing that um, when I heard from Bob Saxon, I met him. He won't say because we're both old now. I'm sorry. We're legends in our own minds. Um, we, uh, Bob, I met him in 2001 or 2002. I was working for what a company at the time was called Sendent, and we were looking to create shared access, what today is called shared access, um, fractionals for yachts, for homes, for automobiles in my company. And so we reached out to the person who seemed from everyone we spoke to, to be the most high integrity person in the industry. And I kid you not, we researched it. And Bob Saxon, it was Bob Saxon Yachts, was it? Bob Saxon Associates. Bob Saxon Associates. And I called, I called, called him. And he was more than gracious. I came down and met him. And then, of course, I went to other, other um, opportunities. And then in 2007, after having met with Jillian Montgomery, you may remember that name. She was the head of Camper Nicholson. I met with Bob. They had acquired Bob's company. And we conceived the Super Yachting Index together as a team with Jillian and Laurent Pignon and you and a couple of other people right here in Fort Lauderdale. And then Camper Nicholson took the concept and they ran with it. Uh, I know that I think they're not doing it any longer, or I'm not sure, but the point is that uh, we conceived that we had a lot of indices in the Luxury Institute, and we recommended the camper, and then the ideas just flourished working as a team together um, to create that product, and they did, a, I think, a beautiful job in informing the industry. So here I am again with Bob, and he's still a legend in the industry, so I just want to acknowledge that. I really think that you are one of the people with the highest integrity in this industry, in the luxury industry throughout. He's known in other parts of the industry. 
and I'm grateful to be here with you guys. I wish you, I wish you all who are very young, a career like Bob Saxon's. That's what I want to wish for you and your children. So I really uh, feel very fortunate to be here. Today, let me see if this is working. Um, I'm going to share with you what I see as, what we see as the trends. We research quite a bit, whether it's secondary research from other industries, companies like Bain, uh, companies that are doing research with affluent consumers, and then we have our own surveys with wealthy consumers. And the topic is going to be high performance client relationship building, but to tee that up, I want to share with you some of the trends that we're seeing. And they may or may not apply in your industry, but let's see. Trend number one is that we are seeing a slowing global economy. We've seen China slow down. That doesn't mean it's dire straits, but it means that China has slowed down. At least in certain uh, categories of the luxury industry, we're probably down anywhere from 8 to 10 percent. So look at apparel, look at watches around the world, look at jewelry. Those categories are being challenged right now. Travel is up, uh, and, and I, we, we see that um, opportunity. Services are up. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the way companies are transforming in a little while. Obviously, the dramatic slowdown in China. A, a lot of people in the luxury industry, at least in goods and some services, said that after 2008, China was what was holding up the luxury industry. U.S. was doing okay, but China was really what held up the luxury industry. And it was interesting because at least in most other luxury categories besides maybe yours, when, when 2008 came, and everybody started discounting, and everybody started suffering, we knew that if the stock market went up, based on history, and if real estate went up, based on history, consumers would start spending again. For the first time in, I would say, decades, maybe even the history of the luxury industry, I, don't, I can't go that far, but I would say in recent history, the stock market is flourishing, the real estate is solid, but we're seeing declines in the spending of categories in certain luxury categories, particularly goods. And that, as I think, is a first in history. And so these are very interesting times because a lot of companies outside your industry don't know what to do. Okay? The other things, obviously, we've seen in terms of luxury goods and some services is the effect of the strong dollar. In some cases, it favors travel, for example, right? In other cases, tourists coming to the U.S., well, that, or buying when they're here, that has been adversely affected. London, for example, in the UK, because of the decline of the pound, they actually have been selling a lot of luxury goods because people are bargain hunting. But that doesn't make you successful over the long term. So there's a lot of dynamics going on in the world today that I think are a first. Obviously, localized terrorism. I don't know, has just, if you just, we're going to be interactive. So how many of you think that localized terrorism has had any effect on the yachting industry? Some? OK. Um, and I, you know, I thought about that when I think it was in Nice, was it in Nice, that we had that event and it shakes you up, right? I'm going to Europe this year and I'm going to be very careful. I'm staying at hotels that are off the high streets, etc. Um, and then Brexit, the effect on the UK and Europe, although it looks like now with the French elections um, that people do want to stay in the European Union, at least that's one barometer, that not everybody wants to be like what we are right now in the United States politically, right? Um, and so, and that's not a comment, that's just objective, right? Whether you love Trump or you don't love Trump, it's been good for business in some ways, right? And let's see how it is for the rest of the country going forward. Uh, and then this weather and climate change, right? Um, you're seeing icebergs melting, you're seeing a lot of activity. I think one interesting thing that is happening, and I don't know if it's happening in the uh, yachting industry, but solar and um, wind energy for example, uh, in West Texas, I was in California recently, a lot of solar, a lot of wind, a lot of investment. The Chinese are now making those panels a lot cheaper and flooding the market, whether that's good or bad. But I think what's going to kill coal is not you know, our treaties with the, uh, with, with the rest of the world. It's the fact that solar and wind energy and alternative energies are just by way of entrepreneurship and business are taking over. So I think that bodes well for the world. I don't think we're going to you know, die of heat unless we're, we're uh, or, or flooded. Uh, I don't think Manhattan Island is going to be flooded necessarily. I think the, the marketplace is determining that solar and wind and other alternative energies are going to be good for us. Uh, Elon Musk is building batteries, and he's selling them to California communities. So I think there's a lot of positive there. I don't think it's as dire as all the media make it seem for climate change. 
And obviously there's intense competition. Maybe not in this industry. I, I don't know, how many of you consider that this is an intensely competitive industry? Okay, there you go. So then in your industry too. I don't want to pretend that I know it, I'd rather get it from you. But everywhere there's intense competition, at least in retail. I would say the traffic in New York stores is down by 20, 30, sometimes 40 percent. It's less on the West Coast. We've seen companies go bankrupt, and we're going to see a lot more retailers go bankrupt. Coach just bought Kate Spade because they were challenged, shall we say. Okay? There are some exceptions, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then I do want to ask you guys, this is really an open question, H how, how many of you feel that artificial intelligence, data, analytics, algorithms are starting to be employed in your industry? Yeah? Because it's touching every industry. I literally was at um, a, an artificial intelligence conference and what's happening I think is going to be fascinating. I'll give you a couple of statistics. That are, that are conflicting, so nobody really knows what's going to happen. One statistic that came out in around 2013 from Oxford University professors, economists, said that in the next, by 2030, half the jobs would be affected, maybe even eliminated, service jobs, okay? So that was one very dire prediction. Then McKinsey came out last year, McKinsey Consulting, and they said no, it's not going to be that half the jobs are going to be eliminated by artificial intelligence and algorithms, what they call now machine learning. Um, they said, but half of what you do in almost every job will be done by computers. And I'll give you one example. So doctors used to be able to diagnose their MRIs, right? They were people, uh, CAT scans, x-rays. A machine can do that far better today than any doctor, okay? Uh, diagnosing diseases. You can take a blood test in a little town in Indiana. The doctor takes the blood test, the nurse takes the blood test, they send it to Quest Diagnostics, IBM Watson, which is the artificial intelligence branch of, of um, IBM, will do the diagnosis. So doctors are no longer having to diagnose they send, the, whether it's a cancer patient, a heart patient, whatever the disease is or the ailment, they will send you back a set of recommendations as a doctor, again, sitting somewhere in Indiana, it could be in Africa, it's getting that, and then it's up to the doctor to help that patient get well. But notice that the one thing that we used to call doctors and say, wow, they're literally geniuses because of their expertise, diagnosis can now be done far better by artificial intelligence. The same thing with lawyers. Lawyers used to look at cases and they used to have assistants and associates, paralegals, looking up cases to see if I'm suing General Electric, let's look at the history of all the cases of all the people who sued General Electric and how did each one of those respond and so what should be my strategy in my lawsuit? A computer can do that in five seconds. So what's the role of the lawyer? What's the role of the doctor? I will argue throughout this presentation that the role now becomes being a high performance relationship builder. That doesn't mean you don't have to know the science, but whether it's in engineering, you know all that coding that's being done? Coding, coding, is everybody, are you getting your kids in school to code? Well the prediction is that artificial intelligence is so good that by 2030, most of the coders will be replaced by artificial intelligence, okay? So it's pervading every part of our lives. There's a lot of chatbots. There's a lot of mythology also on artificial intelligence, but I recommend you get more and more acquainted. I don't think it's gonna replace our jobs. There's a lot of dire predictions. I think what will happen is that the machines win, all the crappy jobs, all the calculation, all the, the inventory management, all the stuff that computers and algorithms can do better, let them do it. It sucks anyway. Pardon my use of technical language, right? At the same time, we are going to have to improve our skills, our emotional intelligence skills, dramatically. One of the other things that I will argue throughout this presentation is that we call those soft skills, as they say in Spanish, nada que ver. That's rubbish. These are hard skills that everyone needs to master and that is what leads to high performance client relationship building. Now many of us are really skilled at that. Some of us even have maybe genetics. 
but everyone can dramatically improve their performance in high performance relationship building. You know, when I, when I was coming here, I, I'm often reminded that when I work with the top real estate agents of uh, Coldwell Banker or Christie's or Sotheby's, very often they go like, I'm a high achiever, like what the heck do you have to teach me? And it's happened with wealth advisors, it happens with the virtuoso top travel agents. So I often walk in thinking, my God, what am I gonna try to teach these people? Because they are good. I mean, I did a group of Colo Banker um, real estate agents and they made three million a year minimum. The two Jills that are down here, for example, some of you may know in Miami. So they're top people. But I sometimes shock them when I tell them that we estimate, having worked with thousands of sales associates in dozens of categories, that most people, as good as they are, are only operating at 40% of their potential. 40%. And that might actually be a generous calculation. So I hope to challenge you in a very positive way to think about my career. And I hope that the, the concepts that we share today will also be concepts that you would apply to your personal life, to your relationship building in your lives. And I will say also this, that it's not easy. We like to say, that if you want to be world class, if you want to be top tier, you need to operate in three places that most people cannot or don't like to go. Space number one is where you are unique. Where you are unique. Obviously we're all unique as humans, but we are unique in terms of offering a value proposition to our clients. The second space is that it is absolutely relevant. It matters to the client. And the third space, it's damn hard to do. Because if you are practicing or doing things that are easy or that are the norm, everybody can do it, right? Any monkey can do it. So if you're not trying to push yourself to the level of high performance where those skills are so difficult or doing the difficult things in your industry, then it won't be as powerful, okay? Any questions or comments? And please, if you have a question, raise your hand. Here's the consumer behavior trends, and I'll go over them very quickly. Millennials have little to no spending power. Now that doesn't mean that they're not going to inherit trillions of dollars. But what I can tell you today is millennials coming out of college, first of all, they have $1.4 trillion, speaking of trillions, of college debt. Second of all, many of the millennials are under employed, that is they are baristas, which by the way is a very, very honorable profession. So we're not criticizing the honor and the integrity of that profession. It is just that they're not earning enough money and they graduated with the equivalent of a small mortgage and they don't even own a house, right? That is the reality today. Millennials will inherit a tremendous amount of money, but not all of them, let's be real. So how do we take care of those millennials? I think that's a question our industry needs to answer. Boomers are decluttering. How many of you know uh, The Real Real? It's a company called The Real Real, and a lot of older, wealthy women, and I know many of them on Park Avenue in New York, are selling their goods so that younger women can buy them because they're decluttering a bit. Less jewelry, less watches. Clearly, the watch industry is in deep trouble right now. Okay, and it's not only the Swiss franc, right? It's a lot of reasons. There is a shift away, and I think that favors your industry for the future, from goods, possessions, having a lot of stuff, to great experiences. And one of the examples is that I see a lot of my friends who are not so wealthy, but they're chartering yachts, right? They're spending money because they want to take the whole family on a great trip in the Med or somewhere else. So I see that, I don't know if you see that, but I see at least a lot more people telling me that they rented a yacht, I'm like, really, okay, awesome. So they got the money together, they pooled it together, whether it's couples or families, and so I think that bodes well. So experiences, depending on how you deliver them, now and in the future, will be part of what gives your industry a tremendous amount of growth. And uh, there is a shift towards online researching and purchasing. How many are you finding that your clients are coming in far more educated than ever before? Yes? And we see that in every industry. So for example, I was lecturing at Harvard and at Columbia University, all the MBA students, and I said, how many of you actually want a relationship with a sales associate? And they said, I'd love to have one. These are all millennials. 
usually rich kids, because only rich kids go to Harvard and Yale, let's be honest, okay? And, um, and they said, of course I want to I wanna have a relationship, but I know so much more than that sales associate. They can't even validate for me my purchase. So I come in far more informed. Remember, these are highly educated people, and wealthy people tend to be highly educated at any age. And so they're coming in, and they're like, well, why am I dealing with this person? Why don't I do the chatbot? Because the chatbot, at least, is going to not take up my time, and they're not going to try to sell me stuff, and they're not going to be, they're not going to lack integrity. So we see a lot more informed wealthy consumers in any category. You're seeing in wealth advisors, a robot, a an algorithm can come up with a portfolio far more optimized than any wealth advisor today. So what is the role of the wealth advisor? I think we're asking ourselves that in every profession, and it's being hyper-stimulated by the fact that clients are so much more informed today, especially the wealthy, in every category of luxury, goods or services, than ever before. And then it's true that all consumers want social responsibility but they don't necessarily want to pay for it. So for example, we work with the beers. They have the Forever Mark uh, brand, and it's usually 10% more for a diamond ring, an engagement ring that is from socially responsible minds. But people don't want to pay that 10% premium. And so you see that across industries that, of course, I want you to have that social responsibility. I want you to be ethical. I want you to be um, economic, uh, environmentally responsible but I don't want to pay extra for it. And by the way, it's becoming such that even like with tanning leather for handbags or for cases, um, you're finding that there's a tremendous use of um, ethical and environmentally friendly methodologies that are actually cost effective, that are cheaper. And then finally, employee turnover. Do you guys have a lot of turnover in your industry? Raise your hand if you have turnover in your industry. Yeah? That's a huge problem. So I was with the head of Burberry retail uh, in London, and he said to me, Milton, my problem is not client retention. My problem is employee and associate retention. So I can do everything. I can train them. I can give them iPads, information, whatever. They don't stay. And I was with a multi-billion dollar conglomerate the other day in San Francisco presenting, and they had a turnover of 30% a year. That's a lot of people, and they were trying to figure out how to do it. Now, what I would like to ask you is, raise your hand if you think that controlling employee turnover is a skill or luck? Luck? Exactly. And so I asked that company, because I'm a little controversial sometimes, I guess. So if it's a skill, then why aren't you getting the skill to retain those associates? What is it that we're preventing, that's preventing us from having the skill to make sure that those people in whom we invest a tremendous amount stay in our industry? Just something to think about. So let me give you the three greatest myths in achieving high performance that we have found with real estate agents, wealth advisors, top travel agents, retail sales associates. By the way, you know, the, uh, the top sales associates at Ferrari make hundreds of thousands of dollars. The top sales associates at um, Bergdorf make $500,000 a year, the personal shoppers. And the average person at um, Bergdorf Goodman makes $80,000. We're working with Stella McCartney right now on building their performance, and the average uh, store manager makes $110,000. What I would argue is those are pretty good paying jobs, right? And so why the turnover? Why don't we retain those great human beings? And why don't we elevate the selling profession to a level where expertise matters tremendously? Okay? Here's myth number one. Okay? So we walk into companies, walk through Armani, Gucci, private jet company, and we say, you got to coach your people. You have to practice every day, and I'll share more of that in detail. And they go, we're already doing that, right? And very often I say, okay, let's run the videotape of your life in your office or your store or your dealership. And when we look at it, it has nothing to do, and I don't think people are lying. There's just this perception that I'm doing this, and it happens to me in my own life, and I'm actually not doing half the things I'm saying, or I'm doing things that are so different. So myth number one, and that's one thing that we did with Gucci two years ago. How many of you have seen the Gucci results? They're up 50% in the first quarter. In a market that's dying, right? You're up 50% in a market that's dying? That's not a statistical accident. Why? Two years ago, 
The CEO with whom we had worked before, Marco Bittari, brought us in and he said, I want you to do several things for me, Milton. And we went workshops across the world with the top 70 people in each region. I want to confront the reality of the marketplace. Number two, I want to confront the reality of our performance. We're delusional and we care so deeply about one another in our company because we care about each other. That we can't face and objectively judge our own performance, the performance of our team, and the performance of our company. We don't like to be mean or unpleasant with one another, so we're not facing up to the reality of performance. And I said to him, Marco, we don't have to face the brutal facts of the marketplace or our performance brutally. We can be compassionate and kind about it. And we set about doing that, and that was the first thing he did to unleash and empower the people in his company. He went away and he said, you guys figure out what the facts are, what we need to do, and then we did it. And one of the most important things we did was create the clienteling program, the client relationship building program. So they transformed their product because they needed to, and if you don't have a great product, you know you, you're not even in the game. But that high performance relationship building set of skills, we needed to work on with 7,000 salespeople. And there, if you Google Gucci, Gucci, Gucci performance, you can see how much empowering people and training them on high performance relationship building skills, emotional intelligence can work. Myth number two is, no, we can't possibly do that. And I want to tell you a real estate agent story from Beverly Hills. So I was doing the same event as I'm doing here and I said to them, how many of you send thank you notes, handwritten thank you notes when, when people reject you? And by the way, let me ask you that question. How many of you send thank you notes to people who say, no, I'm not going to do this charter with you? <laughs> right? And so there was a guy named Joe from Beverly Hills. Big boy, big guy, right? He says, now why the hell would I do that? They rejected me. What is it about rejecting that you don't get, Milton? And I said, well, I respect that. But I want to give you a hint. If you do that enough times, you're going to actually increase your relationships and your referrals dramatically. Maybe not immediately, but over the years. So four months later, I get a call from Joe. And Joe says, Mr. Pedraza, now he's very respectful. Mr. Pedraza? I said, yeah. He says, remember me? Coldwell Banker Previews, Beverly Hills? I said, yeah. He said, well, you know that idea that I said was so silly? I actually did that. And let me tell you a story. There was a lady who had a $25 million house, and I spent a lot of time cultivating the relationship with her. And then she went with another broker, because the broker said the house was worth $25 million. This was a lady who was divorcing. She wanted to sell quickly. I said, OK. He said, so I did what you said. I sat down and I write a, wrote a sincere note, Dear Mrs. Jones, I know that you have made a decision to go with another agent. I understand you made the best decision for yourself at this time. And I want to wish you the best results. And I just want you to know that if you ever need me, I'm here to serve you, always. Now what do you guys think happened? She came back. Right? Because that house was overpriced. So Joe says to me, so she came back and I just sold the house. And next time you're in Beverly Hills, Mr. Pedraza, I want to take you to the best restaurant in Beverly Hills. And I said, Joe, if you don't mind my asking, how much did you make on that house? He said, several hundred thousands of dollars. And I said, and all you want to do is take me to the best restaurant? What's up with that? Okay? The point is that people who want to be high performance, they do the things that other people won't do. Okay? Let me tell you another story. So I told that story in Vail a few months ago to other agents in another company, and one woman came up to me and she said, I have a story for you. I said, okay, tell me that story. She said, it was the 4th of July weekend, this guy wanted to do a land deal in Vail. And um, I was with my children. I hardly ever see my children, so I didn't return the call. The guy was irate, irrational with my boss. And I called him up and I said, uh, I'm so sorry you feel that way. And I called my boss and I said, 
you can fire me because I know I didn't deliver it. And, and the boss was a good guy and he said, no, it's okay. You know, I know you were with your kids. You hardly ever worked. But we got to do something about this relationship. So she said, so I called up that gentleman and I said, I need to come and speak to you. Please, sir, give me a chance to, to at least explain. And she went there, sucked it up, was bad on her ego. She was scared, itless. And she went there, well prepared, well practiced, and said, please don't blame my boss. It's not his fault. I know you told him you're not going to do business with him again. It's all my responsibility. I screwed up, and I know it. And I know that even though I was doing it with good intention for my kids, that you needed help that weekend. It was 4th of July, and I'm really sorry. Please don't fire my boss. And if I could make it up to you in any way, I would love to do that, sir. Because we're all human beings, and I know I screwed up. There's no excuse. I'm not going to apologize like a lot of people do. They go, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know what we call that? A bullshit apology, OK? <laughs> so she didn't go for that. She said, I'm really sorry. It's my responsibility. I let you down. But please don't fire my boss. He's a good guy. He's a, a man of integrity. And I'm the one who failed. She said, and we had a long conversation. She said, I got three multi-million dollar land deals out of that. Now, how many of you have ever done that? Have you ever done that? Yeah. It's a little painful on the ego, isn't it? It sucks. That's what the high performers do, OK? How many of you know Stephen Curry, basketball player? I'll talk a little bit about how he practices later and why he's so great, because he doesn't belong in basketball. He's a scrawny kid, right? Or Serena. She doesn't have the body of a tennis player. She's too muscular. What do they do? to achieve high performance, even though they're not genetically engineered for it. We'll talk about that, OK? So nope, we can't possibly do that. Oh, hell yeah, you can. You just won't do it. I once had a team, we always, when we work with companies, we have them do daily metrics. You know one of the daily metrics we ask them to do is count and record how many times today you were generous. Right? What? How many times I was generous? Yeah. How many times you were generous with the client and maybe with your peers? I have to count that? That, that, that? That's impossible. I can't do that. Oh, yeah, you can. And then when their sales start going up like that, they love it because they're better human beings. But when you ask them to do that, I can't possibly do that. But that's what the top performers do. That's what the high achievers do. That's what the people, and they may not be doing it consciously, but that's what they do. I'll give you another story a little later. And then the third one is, ah, I can do that, but I need more people, more time, more money, and that ain't happening today, okay? You gotta do more with less. And not because your boss said you do, or because the world is mean and cruel, because that's the reality of our marketplace. You gotta be smarter, you gotta be more creative. Any questions, comments so far? Anybody wanna tell a story? Okay. So, what we like to say, well, I'll tell you a quick story, right? So a few years ago, this guy, Marco Bizzari, who's the head of Gucci today, comes to me and he says, you know what, Milton, you've got to stop being the scorekeeper of the luxury industry. You have Four Seasons, Ritz-Carlton, Lexus, Nordstrom as your clients. Instead of recording the indices, why don't you just teach us how to play? So I went to all those brands and I literally asked them, and they were my friends, what are you doing? Huh? And they taught us a very good set of rules. The risk Carlton values, Four Seasons, how they retain people, you name it. They, I mean, we learned a tremendous amount. Nordstrom, how they hire people. But I've got to be honest with you. After that, we ran out of ideas. So where do we go today? I mean, just name a retailer you think or a company you think is like really off the charts on client experience. Ritz Carlton, yeah. Who's that? Jimmy Choo. Jimmy Choo? Okay. Okay, of course. <laughs> you got to prove that with the numbers. Okay, if we can increase sales by 70%, I'm good. Over 12 months, I'll give you 12 months. But so there aren't that many examples. Even Apple, right? Why do we go to the Apple Genius? Usually because our phone is broken. That's no fun. And I have a special business account. I know Angela Aaron's the head of retail. She was at Burberry. She's a colleague of mine. I get good service. But I don't want to go to the Apple genius, OK? It's kicking and screaming that I go, because it's usually a problem. My phone died. That's not a good thing, OK? 
So we couldn't find a lot of examples after we exhausted all those great companies. So what did we start doing? We started researching how the military, who spends millions of dollars, teaches officers to have empathy to build relationships in Afghanistan and Iraq. There's a whole industry, Google it. Just say um, uh, officers learning em empathy in the US Army. We learn how Israeli pilots are trained to make sure they don't crash, right? We learned how doctors practice in operating rooms when they have to save a life. And the more, I hate to be gory, but the more life and death there is involved, the more we want to learn from them because they can't mess around, okay? And I'll talk about that later. Like, would you like, very often, like in this industry, do we have official training programs? So we just put people to learn by doing. Learn by doing? Yeah? Well, how would you like your doctor to learn by doing on your child? Or you? You like that? You're just out of medical school? No worry, doc here, open me up. That's what we do in industry, right? We don't have practice, we don't have coaching, we don't have metrics. It's all learn by doing. Training? You'll learn and you'll learn my way, right? Well, surgeons today have coaches and they practice. They practice on watermelons, they practice on dummies, they practice on whatever is most realistic, and they do it offline so that they don't have to kill you, okay? And they still make mistakes. So imagine in our industry, like when you say, do you practice? I gotta be honest, I practiced many times before I came up to you, because you deserve my practice, right? You want me to be your first timer here? I did, a, I did an event for Caring, which is a multi-billion dollar company. I practiced that presentation 25 times, and I'm not ashamed to say it. And I'm old, I've been doing this for years. They deserve excellence. Now you'll judge today whether you thought this was excellent or not, but I definitely want to open your mind to the fact that if you want to be a top performer, you have to start treating yourself and thinking of yourself like an elite athlete. I'll repeat that, like an elite athlete. Okay? Serena would never disrespect herself and not practice before that match and not practice every day. But the rest of us, we're not worth it. And companies, practice? They gotta work. And then they screw up and they wanna know why are people not achieving high excellence? Right? Measure yourself and on stupid things like how many times were you trustworthy today or generous? That guy's crazy. This is business, man. I'm dealing with a company right now where the head of sales said, I have a technique that works really well. I said, really, what is it? He said, I have them say yes to me about five or six times, and then on the seventh time, they actually sign up. Anybody ever hear of that technique? Okay, you, you want it? Can I try, do you use it? Because, okay, because I'll try it on anybody right now. Is that a nice shirt you're wearing? I like it. <laughs> you like your mustache and your beard? Yes, sir. How about your pants, you like those? Will you sign a $100,000 contract for me, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's absolute bullshit, okay? And I'm saying it right now, absolute bullshit. Okay? That's not the way the world really works today. There's too much transparency, people know us. People have a reputation. Okay? We're not perfect, any of us, but we have reputations. And soon we'll be rated even more so than we've ever been before. So client relationships. And I want to tell you another story. I would say that in today's world, what we believe and what we're learning from the science, not the mythology, but the science of cognitive relationship building. How does the brain work? Trust. You need to not just outlearn, so you constantly have to learn, be an expert on your industry, be an expert on dealing with people. Because remember, AI, artificial intelligence, is going to do the rest. We need to outperform, which means we need to take great action. But most importantly, we need to outbehave our competition. That's not a term I invented, but it's a term I use. Outbehave your competition. What does that mean? And I'll tell you a story to bring it to life. Sorry. Number one is you have to be an expert, you have to be a master at your craft. You have to be knowledgeable and more knowledgeable on yachts and on your customers, I was talking to some of you, than anybody else. And that takes a lot of work. You have to be an expert on your craft and you have to be an expert on people. And there are three, three attributes of emotional intelligence 
Uh, we have surveyed wealthy people, ultra wealthy people every year that they say they want from an associate. Number one is empathy. The ability to listen to me, ask me powerful questions, and then provide an appropriate solution or appropriate response. Empathy. But that's not a quality you're born with, that's a skill. We think it is, but it's a skill. Number two is the ability to be trustworthy. The ability to communicate to people verbally and with body language that you are here to serve their interests first and foremost. That you'll get paid, because you need to make a living, by creating great value for them first and foremost. And from what I've heard, there are a lot of sharks in most industries and probably this industry is no different. I always say to people, what you don't get is that you think that Darth Vader is the only one who's entitled to make money, but Anakin Skywalker and Princess Leia, they can make a hell of a lot more money. It's just that it takes longer, there's a different arc, because you don't get instant gratification when you act like a shark. It takes a while for your integrity to build, so you get some short-term gratification, you get some medium-term gratification, and then if you're there enough years, the money just starts pouring in. Am I wrong? Absolutely right. I, had a, I just got a million dollar contract from a guy who I knew seven years ago, hadn't talked to him. He said, I thought of you when I became the president of the company. And that sounds just to, to toot my own horn. It happens all the time, but people don't seem to get that sometimes. We think, we gotta sell. We're transactional, right? Gotta grab that now. I gotta eat, my kids have to eat. Yeah, they also have to learn to be good human beings. And they look at you as the example, right? They look at us as the example. So let me tell you a story about expertise, empathy, trustworthiness, and generosity. There was a very wealthy guy in Australia and he bought a BMW 750 Li, which is the top of the line BMW. And he forgot to order a connector for his, um, for his devices. He went back to the dealer and he said, I need to order this, I forgot to order it. He said, yeah, yeah, it's gonna take 90 days to get that. 90 days? Yeah, 90 days, you know, we import our cars into Australia. So because he's a very wealthy entrepreneur, he goes to the Mercedes dealer, whom he knows, and he says, how long would it take you to get me that part if I forgot to order it? If I bought the S500, he said, uh, we're much better than BMW. We'd get it for you in four weeks. Four weeks, okay, better. He went to the Lexus dealer. The Lexus dealer said, sir, I'll be back to you in 12 hours. He said, what? You can't even tell me the answer? He said, sir, just let me work on it, I'll be back to you in 12 hours and I'll give you the response. What do you think came 12 hours in a nicely beautiful package box 12 hours later? The BMW part. The BMW part. Expertise? Yes or no? Empathy? Trustworthiness? Generosity? Right? And so people said to this guy, who's a colleague of mine, yeah, but you still love your BMW. You're still driving a BMW, right? He said, yeah. But I recommended 10 people over the last three years to Lexus, and he sold seven cars. That, to us, is what people who are very high performing do almost automatically every day. They get the equation of high performance. So they're not just going for the transaction, right? Another guy would have said, listen, I don't even know, you're coming in here, you want a BMW, what the hell, right? Just like the note, the thank you notes. You can tell that guy, Joe in Beverly Hills, he writes thank you notes every day now, right? And he was already making $3 million a year. And by the way, he told me he feels better as a human being. That's the byproduct, right? He's actually nice, can you believe it? I mean, I'm Colombian, okay? I'm Colombian, I know what ruthless is, okay? <laughs> but I've chosen to be different, okay? A better way. And most of my Colombian colleagues are, I mean, Colombia now is turning upside, you know, the other way. Now it's like, how good can we be? And I love it, right? So, I would say this. You need humility and stay teachable. We like to say, and I hope this won't offend anyone, and you have to just ask yourself, that there are people with decades of expired experience. They're no longer experts. Like the way we drive a car, we're not experts. Danica Patrick is an expert because she is a race car driver and she's learning and constantly testing herself, right? To the rest of us, we're amateurs. We think we're good, 
That's why computers can do better than, I mean, that's why self-driving cars can do better than we do, right? And they won't kill 40,000 people a year. But you have to stay humble. And no matter how great you are, like that real estate agent, or those real estate agent stories I told you, you have to stay open to what other things I can do to achieve high performance. And then I have to do it consistently because the biggest challenge is not that you're not gonna get best practices. In fact, very often we know what the best practices are. It's that we fail to execute them well because we never practice them. We fail to do it consistently, so we do it once in a while, but it's not always, or at all, and this is really important, when it really matters, okay? When the client really needs something, and when it really matters, that's when we have to deliver, right? And by the way, you have to put up with the fact that you may be good, you may have the best intentions, but they're not gonna like it, they're gonna reject you a lot. So I was trying to be more kind and generous, and I walked, uh, I was at City Core Center, and I saw this older gentleman with a baby carriage. And he was taking it up like five stairs. So I went and I said, can I help you? And you know what he said? What do you think he said? And I quote, get the fuck away from me, okay? <laughs> and so I had to stop and think. I had good intentions, right? I, I didn't say, oh my God, what a loser, right? He didn't, he didn't see my beautiful humanity and generosity. He just rejected me outright and he cursed me out too. I had to look, step back and say, I wonder what it was for that gentleman that he felt threatened, right? Because as my grandma used to say, there's only love and there's fear, right? Like the fear we have, I gotta get that money, I gotta close the transaction, right? And so I don't know what happened. I never got to talk to the gentleman because I did step away, I said, I'm sorry, sir. But the point is that the great achievers know that sometimes, maybe even often, they're gonna get rejected and they're gonna get rejected because they're misunderstood or they just didn't execute it properly. It doesn't matter, you keep going. That's resilience, right? Michael Jordan missed lots of shots at the end of the game and he kept taking them, right? So that's the kind of opportunity I think we have to master skills that matter tremendously. And I'm gonna give you some very specific recommendations. But first I wanna know, in your industry, how much is it Luck and how much is it skill? And by the way, keep me on time, okay? How much is luck and how much is skill? Let's say 50% of your success is luck, 50% uh, is skill, 70 luck, just shout it out. Just give me some numbers. How much of it is luck? 60% is luck, which means 40 is skill. Any more, anybody else? 45 luck, so, okay, 25% luck and the rest is skill, 75%. Anybody else? Zero what? Is what, luck? Okay. All right, so let me give you some examples. Thank you for being, I love it. There's no perfect answers. But here's something, so there's a guy. So we think it's like this, okay? We think it's, and I've asked a lot of CEOs, in most industry, they believe it's like poker. Let me give you an example. In roulette, how much is it luck or skill? Luck, 100%, right? In chess, which is a skill you build up over time, there are actually studies of, I don't, wouldn't, wouldn't recommend this, but Tiger Woods is an example, of parents who have inculcated, raised their kids to be chess masters, and they became chess masters. Because it's mostly skill. You learn it, you do it. Because there's not a lot of luck being involved, unless the weather comes in and there's a thunderbolt of lightning coming through the ceiling, it's, there's not a lot of external factors affecting a chess game, right? Poker, now poker is what? 50-50 maybe? Yeah, yeah, and we believe that business is like that. And we believe that 60% is the product, right? You gotta have a great yacht. You gotta have a great offering for the client. But then that 40%, that's skill. That's highly controllable, okay? How many of, know, of you know what a trim tab is? I'm just asking. <laughs> And the rudder, of course, right? So the trim tab is the rudder of the rudder, right? Correct? There's a big sh yacht, there's the rudder, and then there's a little trim tab, correct? Am I technically correct or am I off? Am I good? Okay. And the rudder doesn't move the ship, right? First the trim tab has to move the rudder and the rudder moves the ship, right? 
correct? I mean, I studied this, I read it online, Google it. I could be totally wrong. Google is not always right, there's a lot of fake news out there, okay? I don't even know who's president today. But, okay, so the point that I'm making is the trim tab on a plane or on a ship, on a boat, is what gives you leverage, right? The rudder can't displace all that water, but the trim tab displaces the rudder, and then that moves the rudder, and the rudder displaces the water that moves the ship. So you gotta find the leverage factor, the controllable factor, okay? And that's your trim tab. And to me, your trim tab, or the leverage, the factor that you can apply pressure and moves the ship, is the relationship building piece. Okay, because you don't control the product, you're not building the yachts, maybe you are, but not most of you, right? You take whatever inventory is out there and you do something beautiful with it, right? So you have a very controllable factor. But a lot of us don't realize how much is luck and how much is skill. So there's this guy from Columbia University who wrote a book, I don't recommend it because it's very technical and quantitative, okay? But there's some great lessons in that book and he says, untangling skill and luck in business, in sports, and in investing, okay? Today, most investing is done, I mean, the, the company that's gaining the most investors is Vanguard, why? Because it's index funds. It's not managed money. Because the statistics show that being a money manager, just take the dice and put them out there, okay? You're not Warren Buffett. Being a money manager today is a game primarily of luck, not skill. And by the way, most trading is computerized, which means that algorithms do it a lot better than humans. So being a wealth advisor today is not such a great career unless you transform into a humanistic person. The fact that you could put together a portfolio for the client, the stocks and bonds, no longer valuable in the industry. I don't know if there's an equivalent for you in your industry. I don't know if there is. But if there is, you've got to be aware that it's going to come to our industry as well. So what this guy Mubasan basically says is, look, life is like poker. Business is like poker. Half of it you don't control. Do we control the weather, the economy, the elections? No. So those are the uncontrollable factors. But then in poker, for example, with the luck, you can win a hand one day. You can lose a hand in one day. I just want to ask you, if a, if a client, if a billionaire client comes to you and says, I want that yacht, calls you up, says, I want that yacht, I want it this date, I want to know if it's available, and book it for me right now, do you consider that luck or skill? It's damn luck, okay? <laughs> Unless you really screw it up and then you lack skill, all right? But you've got to know the difference. Whenever those transactions are coming in, like I always tell a salesperson at Gucci or Chanel, if somebody walks in and says, I want to buy this, 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 and this, and this, I don't even try it on, that doesn't make you good, okay? You are damn lucky. <laughs> I'm damn lucky that Saxon called me up and got me here, okay? But then I got to deliver, right? So when luck has little influence, right, little influence, you got to build skill, 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 skill. But in a game of both luck and skill like poker, what he says, you got to build a process, a system over time. So poker players who win, on any given day, they could have good luck or bad luck. They know that, okay? And they accept that. But they have developed a set of rules, a set of processes to make sure that over the long run, a good process will have a good outcome over time. Which means in our in our business that if you're going to be a top performer in this industry, you've got to have a system and you're going to have to build it over time. And time is the only thing that will take care of you becoming a top performer sooner for some, later for some, but you've got to have a system. How many of you feel you have a system that helps you achieve and helps you getting better? Okay. We'll talk about that a little later. But so you know that it takes a system. And here's another book that I recommend, it's called Peak. Secrets from the New Science of Expertise, and it is a science. Andrew Erickson, who is, I think, at Florida State, and he's been studying performance for 30, 40 years. Just Google it, Andrew Erickson, one of the most fascinating guys. He's boring to listen to, but his research is phenomenal, okay? And he says, the differences between expert performance and normal adults are not immutable. That is, they are not unchangeable. They are not 
inherited. How many people think that um, you know people who are people persons? They just are, right? But you don't know how they were raised. You don't know if they, I always, when I meet people who are personable, I go, you had good parents. And they go, yeah, I did. So they, a lot of that is skill that is built. It's not deliberate necessarily, but they had good role models. They had good attachment, they were babies. The science says that all of us are born with certain genetics and all of us are born to survive and thrive because that's the nature of humanity. But some of us never build up those skills because we think, well, I'm not good with people. I'm better with numbers. Rubbish. It's things we tell ourselves that are pure, delusional, mythology, or other people say, Milton, you're so good at that, you should be that. I was told that I was a great finance person, I was good with numbers, and I was miserable for the first five years of my life. I've spoken to someone who has a law degree in this industry who says, I hated law. It's the last thing I wanted to do, but my parents told me I had to do it. How many of you had an experience like that? Okay, then you're fortunate if you haven't had it, okay? But I know I had to back out of finance to get into people things. And here's the other thing that I think is important, and I'm gonna share a couple of statistics from this book because I remember from, my, from when we did that event in uh, the Bahamas with Camper that most of the people in the charter part of the industry are women, and most of the yacht building sales are men, is that right, in the industry? Some interesting things, okay? Um, this is a book called Humans Are Underrated, What High Achievers Know That Brilliant Machines Never Will. And basically what this guy Jeff Colvin says is, yeah, machines are gonna replace a lot of the functions that we do, a lot of the rote, repetitive jobs that we do in any industry, machines are gonna replace that. In manufacturing, as I said before, in medicine, in law, in coding, you name it, there is no industry that is not going to be touched by this, or is not being touched. So then what is the role of humans? And what Colvin says, and he proves with a great deal of research, is that high performance relationship skills are gonna be the skills for the 21st century. And that there are jobs that we can't imagine will be in demand, that there'll be a lot more services. And I'll give you one small example. I'm working right now with a university, with a company that is, is a, it's an education group that does massage therapy. They teach people to do massage therapy and they cannot keep up with the demand for massage therapists and sports therapists, right? And uh, how many of you know, especially the ladies, Benefits, the company Benefits, right? They do brows, right? So they have incorporated services into their selling uh, skin care and cosmetics. And how many of you know Fresh, which is a, an LVMH brand? They do facials. They get you to sit down and do the facials for free so that you can buy the product. So there's a lot more services being incorporated. I noticed, for example, that Camper too, right? And Camper has four new services. I think they do financing. I thought they did some sort of like travel services. So there's more services being incorporated in every company's portfolio, okay? And that's because the human touch and the humanity, the emotional intelligence skills, the more that we get artificial intelligence, the more we're gonna to have to rely on jobs that are more what I call caring jobs, C-A-R-I-N-G. Healthcare, all kinds of services that we can't even imagine today, but that will be coming in the future. And your job, I think, will be transformed because an artificial intelligence chatbot can look up the yacht that fits that person, and then your job is to make sure that that entire experience is phenomenal. It may be the case right now, because you have multiple listing service, right? It's gonna get even better. That's not gonna be the key differentiator for you. It'll be the relationship and how that experience goes. On relationship metrics. So I'll give you an example. In, in a store, we measure how many times, how many people did we inspire, not coerce, not cheat, how many people did we inspire to get to the fitting room? Because we know if she gets to the fitting room, she's likely to buy. The probability goes up dramatically. How many pieces did you put up in the fitting room? Because we know that if you dress her from head to toe and you really inspire her by styling her honestly, the conversion rates are up 100%. In the automotive industry, if we can inspire you through trust, empathy, generosity to go and test drive that car, the likelihood of buying it goes up dramatically. What does that look like in your industry? What's the metric? If the client does what, then how does the probability increase? What increases the probability of someone chartering a yacht with you 
Do you know what those metrics are? It's not a trick question. <laughs> so my question is, what are the behaviors? And then I'll give you another example where we've taught people right now in stores, the traffic is down 50%. So we have a metric called what is the percentage of business that came in through traffic versus the percentage of business that you generated yourself. So a store is not a place where people come to buy and you sell them stuff. A store is a relationship building center. And so we've transformed companies from now 50% of what they're selling in a week comes from their own efforts. The fact that a prospect came in and they got the information and they followed up with a thank you note and then later on with a suggestion. The fact that you're nurturing your clients and not just your best clients, the ones that we call dormant. And the third part is that you're going out there and doing what we call institutional clienteling. You're getting other brands and other companies that cater to the same person that you cater to, and you're doing events together, you're doing things together that drive business for both of you. We call that institutional clienteling, okay? And we've taken companies where 5% of the sales were, doesn't this suck? Let me text my boyfriend. There's no party coming in today to doing clienteling, calling, texting, going out there, going to networking events, and then their sales go up astronomically. Does that make sense? Because they were doing nothing before, now they're relationship builders, right? But they do it systematically and they measure. I'm going to this networking event, I'm going to get five cards from people who are relevant. We have a company called Not Standard. They make custom men's products, K-N-O-T standard. Because of the referral program they put in place, because of the relationship building program they put in place, they grew 70% seven months in a row, seven zero. Their investors brought us in, they were floundering, and they didn't, we didn't do it. We coached, but they played. The point is they really transformed into high performance relationship builders. And that's eminently doable for anyone, anyone, especially the young people who are here. You can master that craft. And even, we would say that even the people who are very experienced, only 40% of your potential is being realized right now. Number four, oops, what am I doing? Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. These are examples of metrics that you can have. Appointment conversion rate, recovery, how many people didn't buy for a long time and you recovered them. Referral rates, client referral rates, client retention rates, all kinds of other metrics. But I don't know what the metrics are in your industry. What you need to do is identify the kinds of things that people don't measure in your industry because they have no, let's say, on the surface, they're looking at dollars and how many charters as opposed to the behaviors that drive those, okay? So think about that. I don't, we don't have enough time here to do it, but what are the things that you know that if you do right by the client, your performance will go up dramatically? I'll tell you what mine is. I used to go to all these conferences and put up booths. Useless. I used to do interviews with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, right? Useless. Sitting down one-on-one -on -one with the CEO or the C-level with no slides, we used to have a 5% conversion rate, which is the normal consulting industry. We have 22%. And when I tell people that, they go, what? Yes, 22%. One is because a lot of them are referrals, and the other one is because we don't try to sell. We don't sell. We try to give people value and use that empathy and that trust within us and generosity and we send thank you cards, whether they reject us or not, and we mean it. And anyone can do that, right? Whether it's your personal life or your professional life. The other one is get a coach and be a coach. I said that before, so I'm not gonna repeat it, but the training program can be developed by you. We never go in and build a training program for Gucci, for Chanel, for Ferrari, anybody. The top people in the company build a training program. Who knows better than they do? And so they build it, and so they have, it has buy-in, it has legitimacy. And then everyone deserves a coach. This is a tool go on that the doctor I told you about. So imagine that a tool go on there writes an article, and it, he's, he's operating on a patient, and his coach is standing next to him. And the, you know, imagine being the patient looking up, and the doctor says, oh, th that's my coach. <laughs> and normally the reaction is, what, you need a coach? But your reaction should be just the opposite. <laughs> Your reaction should be, that Harvard doctor who's got 25 years experience still has a coach? You're gonna operate on me, yeah, okay? 
because I get you, okay? That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of strength. That's a sign of power. Whereas most of us would say, I don't want to be touched by that doctor. You're making the wrong conclusion. You get that? How powerful that is for someone that expert, that knowledgeable to have a coach? And why? Because so his, his coach would say, you know, a tool, when, when you moved your elbow this way, you blocked the light for the nurse. Now, you think that he would be aware of that? Or that most doctors care about that? But he does care about that, and that's the difference. I don't know if I convey nothing else to you today. It's that those little points of difference are what makes a great achiever. But most people are not going to do it, which is your advantage, okay? Most people are going to walk out of here and say, that was great, I was inspired, but I'm not going to do that yet. Okay? <laughs> that's too much work. Yes, it is. But if you do it, I guarantee you, your conversion rate will go up. You're going to make a lot more money. And you're going to feel a lot better about being a great human being who you are because we're all born to be great human beings. It's just that we walk into work and like, oh man, this is my game face. <laughs> I'm at work now. I can't be the good human being who I am. I got tattoos. Fuck that. <laughs> huh? I can't be good, decent, kind. People are going to take advantage of me. Bullshit. Okay? And I say that with all strength. You all know how good you can be. Don't leave your good humanity at home. Bring it to work. Okay? If you remember nothing else about me, bring it to work. I guarantee you it changed my life because I used to be a real young asshole. Okay? <laughs> Corporate executive, step on everybody. And it took a lot of going back to my grandmother's values and my mother's values and having a child and realizing, what am I going to teach that child? And then he taught me. So I don't want to become motivational here because it's high performance, meaning that there is a system, but the system requires that you bring your emotional intelligence to work every day and that you work on your emotional intelligence skills dramatically. Okay, I'm going to go faster here, but I'll say this is from a great guy, Triggers. Um, Marshall Goldsmith is a coach to CEOs, and he says, we do not have the ability to objectively evaluate ourselves. That means we're delusional, including me. We deny our need for help and structure, which is why we need a system. And very importantly, we completely overestimate our willpower to make changes. I'm on a diet. I've been on a diet for the last three years. <laughs> I can't lose this paunch, okay? And I'm a skinny guy, which means I'm shaped like a pear, okay? Skinny legs, skinny arms, and then a big stomach, okay? And I'm old. I still can't do it so well. I'm trying now, but the reality is we have to face reality. I remember when I was losing my hair, right? And I used to pull it over to the side. I'm sure nobody noticed that, right? <laughs> I'm sure no one noticed that, okay? So we've got to face reality. I'm not going to go over this other than to say that one, everybody's different. There is no average, so we all need individual metrics, individual coaching, individual skills building. But the other thing is that they've done a lot of work on coaching, and when they put teachers, doctors, athletes, and you just train them, but you don't have coaching and metrics and practice, after 10 months, it all disappears. But if you do have it, 95% of those people are achieving great performance at the end of that period. So that's the difference between metrics, coaching, practice. Yes, okay. Use technology in fun ways. I have all these little triggers that I write on my calendar. Like one of the triggers I have for losing weight that's working is no food after 4 p.m. I have my breakfast, I have my lunch, and then I don't eat dinner. I have maybe a light salad, and that has helped me to lose weight. So all these little triggers that you can use to remind yourself, I'm divorced. So I had to remind myself, for me, after I got divorced and I left home, unfortunately, I see my kid five days a week but I call him every single morning. I had to put a trigger that said, call Tanner and tell him you love him, and then I put one underneath that said, and call your mother. <laughs> I don't call my mother as often, but I call my kid every day, and now it's becoming grain. So whatever tricks, little triggers you can use, use them, because they're good reminders every day um, of the things you need to do. Ask clients for simple feedback, and this is the survey that I would say to you that you can create. It has six questions in it. From zero to 10, rate me on my expertise. Am I an expert? From zero to 10, rate me as to whether I'm empathic. I actually listen to your needs. 
From 0 to 10, rate whether you think I'm trustworthy or not. From 0 to 10, rate if you think I'm generous or not. And then two open-ended questions. What is the one thing I did that created the most value for you, that was most relevant, that I did? One thing. And then what's the one thing I could have done that would have created more value for you if I had done it? Okay? Very simple, no, no 20, 20 question survey, just honesty. You could do that right now with me, right? And by the way, I know that some of you would rate me low on some of those metrics. And I would love to have that learning, even though it might be really painful. Don't get me wrong, it's not that it's not painful, right? We know that, right? It's that the learning would be good. And then I'd have to say, well, yes, that gentleman thought maybe I was too animated. Maybe I was too loud. And I might have been, by the way or something else, or what's the one thing I could have done? Well, Milton, maybe you could have talked more about this and given us a little more detail about that instead of making it an abstract idea. So we all have to deal with this. This is not like I'm recommending you do it, but I'm not gonna do it. We do this all the time, and we learn a tremendous amount from people giving us feedback, and most people are kind about it. They're compassionate, they know they're human too. There are a few mean people, but that's not gonna be the most that you're going to get in feedback. There's going to be a tremendous amount of learning you're going to get. And finally, we like to say you need to be a super connector in your community. You need to know the doctors, you need to know the lawyers, you need to know the bankers, you need to be the center of the hub of a network. The people who we know are extremely successful know and I'll give you a silly example, but it was a very critical one. For my former wife, I went to the shoemaker, and, I, and he's a great shoemaker, and I said, you know, Ma, she has a problem with, you know, spinal. Uh, he said, I know a great doctor in New York, I'm gonna recommend them to you. I think he saved her life. And he's the shoemaker. That kind of super connector recommendation that you can add value beyond what you're selling, is massively helpful. I'm sure a lot of you do it, am I right? Just have to do it more systematically and get to know more people and spread more good. Obviously the people you recommend have to be top tier because that's your reputation. But that is one of the most important things we see the great achievers do. So, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But now, thank you. And now, as I said before, there's tremendous learning, and that's how we always have people do their own training programs. We don't build it for them, because there's tremendous expertise in you, and you know that. So we're gonna have you do an exercise at each table. We're gonna ask you to select a spokesperson. I'm gonna read the questions, three simple questions. And then we want you to select a spokesperson to please present so that you can share with everyone. And so, and you'll see a lot of common themes, and so, so is it clear? You're gonna select a spokesperson, you're gonna speak and share amongst yourselves, and we're gonna give you the three questions to answer, which are gonna be, I think, a little bit, a little challenging, but hopefully you get a lot out of it. Oops, why, oh, okay. So let me see. Okay, so, work individually for 10 minutes and answer these questions. What are the three, only three, relationship building best practices that you know you execute well, and there may be many more than what I mentioned, yet you may, not be, you may not have mastered that yet. So what are three practices that you know are good best practices, you're doing them well, but not at a level of expertise or mastery? Three, so write that down for yourselves individually. What are three relationship building best practices that you could be doing but they feel too difficult to implement. You know you should do it, maybe it's the opposite of what you normally think, like the thank you cards, but they're damn hard to do, period, and so you're not really doing them. And then, at the end, what's the one thing, one thing that you wanna do personally or professionally to take your performance to the next level? What is that next level? Like, would you like to increase your sales by 20%? What, what is it? You can quantify that, but then what is it that you want to work on for yourself? And you don't have to share that with the whole team if you don't want to, although what I like to do is create safe spaces. No guilt, no judgment, just performance, right? 
And that is really important when you're trying to be a great achiever that you are not, you know, my little boy practices the violin and he goes, ugh, and I go, no. Stay calm, self-assess, self-measure, self-correct, self-coach, and move forward. And that's what great achievers learn to do, not to judge themselves or feel guilty or get emotional about their mistakes. Not only do they embrace the challenge of mistakes, they crave it. You know what it feels like to crave something? And I'll tell you one final story, Invisalign. A friend of mine just got Invisalign and she, her teeth looked phenomenal after four months. She's a very senior level executive. She said, I don't know why I never did it. And she says, every time I put on a tray and I know it's gonna hurt, but I crave it because I see the results now. Have any of you ever had Invisalign? Maybe you don't wanna admit that, but uh, the point, doesn't it after a while you see the results? It's just like you can deal with the pain. Performance is a little bit like that, okay? So I'm gonna give you the time now, take 10 minutes, and then we're gonna come back, and you're gonna work, take 10 minutes to write it down for yourself, maybe five minutes if you're fast. Then we're gonna have 10 minutes of talking with each other, we're gonna shorten it, and then you're gonna share your results. Deal with everyone. Go. Okay, let's start at this end. You're up, just stand up and I think someone's gonna have a microphone, but if not, okay. I'll do it. Are you gonna do it? I'll do it. Okay. Okay, so the group's answers for number one yes. is we always do the thank you correspondence. Okay. Um, even when we were dinged for something. Um, we build relationships. Um, among our network, so that's something we always do. And then um, uh, providing information to our clients, even if it doesn't benefit us. If I know you're involved with a certain business transaction or you're doing something that is making news and I see an article on that, I'll forward that to you Okay. with nothing else. So okay. that's one, two, three things that we could do better. Um, we just have to choose one, is that what you said? Choose one, give me one, one that you would okay. absolutely like to do. Um, more consistent follow-up, it's more of a time management, making, making that more of a, t a priority okay. in your time management. Thank you so much. Yep. We'll do the applause at the end. So who's the spokesperson here? Yeah. Please. So in fairness, we didn't have too much time to talk as a table. Of course, I, I shared enough. mine and got elected to be the spokesperson pretty, Good. pretty rapidly. There you go. So, 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 so best practices, I think we're doing fairly well, is we, we really listen to the customer. We have a, a lot of dialogue before a charter, and we talk about what they want to do and what the kind of experience they're, they're looking for, and we customize the, the service offering to meet exactly what they'd like to do. And hey, we, we have their name on a board when they come in and welcome stuff, and we'll decorate and, and really right. go above and beyond what they're expecting. Uh, we make the customer comfortable with our our own experience and our, you know, we, we build credibility and we really show that we're committed to making them happy. And then the last thing is we ask for feedback in a private way. We have a book that they pass around and they give us uh, whatever feedback they'd like to write in the book. Okay, so you get feedback, thank you. All right, what about here? Who's the spokesperson? Great. Hi, my name is Shalom Weiss, and yes, time was short, so our team did Sorry. not get a chance to uh, join all of our answers, but just in chatting, we did find out they're similar. Uh, one of the things is networking, speaking to people properly, and following up is very important. Um, also, training team members with the knowledge that they need to perform more successfully, and um, having mentors and people above you with expertise is also important to learn and to grow. So those are things that we came up with. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we're back. So who's the spokesperson? Okay. Thank well, you. She's not back yet. Go for it. It's all right. <laughs> uh, just in general, what we came up with is networking, uh, follow-up, and yes. building relationships. Okay. All right. I think in the interest of time, because we are running out of time, am I right? Uh, yeah. I think we're going to stop here. We ran out of time, but thank you so much. Some of you are spared, um, but you get the gist. I, and I think the final thing I want to say to you is I wish you great luck, but I wish you even better skill. Okay? So thank you. Thank you.